Well, uh, it, it starts out like when music came to my school, Lincoln High School, it's called, it was called. Everybody in school signed up, I mean, lined up for instruments, every single person. And I happened to get there a little bit late, so I was really deep in the line. And I go up, and everybody wanted to play drums. Of course, drums went first. I didn't know that, but I heard the kid in front of me ask for a drum, and the next one asked, so I asked for a drum. And of course, there's no drum because there isn't too many people. And finally, they had this mellophone, which is not, it's not that beautiful looking instrument. It's just round with these keys on it. And so that's all they had left, so I took that. And my band director, a guy's name Earl Jones, he did not like what I did with the mellophone. And basically, because I hated the mellophone, I did nothing with it. And my friend Henry in the next room, he didn't like what he did with the trumpet. So maybe Henry didn't like the trumpet. In any case, he got frustrated and he says, listen, you go to this room and he sent Henry to the room I was in. And he said, leave the instrument. So I inherited the trumpet and he inherited the, the mellophone. And, and the end of that story is, is that both of us became the two best players in the ensemble. Now, after getting this trumpet so started in, before I had a complete idea about all the notes that was possible, that is, the 12 chromatic notes, I had no idea about those. I had four or three, more like four or five notes that I knew. So I get this urge to write a piece of music. I sat down and I started working on it for three trumpets. And I write one line, and then I come back and write the next line, the next line. This is over like maybe two days. So when I started, I started out with the notes that I knew. I put them in first. And the ones I didn't know, I kind of just looked in the book to see what they were, and I put them in the score, okay? And then I go to school, I get Sam T. Scott, Cleo Hall, and me, the player. And so we get started. They knew the same four or five notes I knew, so the first part of the piece, we could get the notes right, okay? Then when we get to a note we don't know, we pick up the book, look in it, check out what the fingering was. If the finger was the first valve, then we apply the first valve and see if we could get it. And eventually the band director who was sitting in the room before heard us practicing. So he come down and says, what you guys doing? I said, well, we playing a little piece I composed. He goes back and get his saxophone and come in and sit down and play with us. He didn't transpose. He just sat down and played with us. From that, I decided that I was a composer. Okay, and I went to my library and read everything that had to do with music to see what composers do. And I discovered that they actually just wrote music. And so I feel really cool that, okay, now I'm a composer. Well, let's jump 20 some years later. I'm in Europe, I'm in Italy, in the army band. And I keep having this feeling to write something down but not what I know. And so I started looking for it, meaning I started like just sketching things out and stuff like that. And I was there for, I was in Europe for two years, two and a half years, nothing clear. I, but I had lots of examples of what I'm trying to do. So finally I get out of the army, I find out from a fellow in my band that Anthony Braxton lives in Chicago and he had his, his mother's telephone number, so he gave it to me. So when I get to Chicago, I call Anthony Price and we get together and we play a little bit. But, well, I, I said, Anthony, uh, you know, like, I would like to be in the ACM, blah, blah, blah. Well, Anthony is kind of a space guy. You can't really get him to do much, you know. So he kept saying, yes, yes, I'll do it, I'll do it. But he never did. So one day I'm in my neighborhood walking around. I see this nice sign that says, Joseph Jarman, Christopher Gaddy, Thurman Barber, and Charles Clark are going to play at this coffee house. So I'm excited. And it says under the ACM. So I'm excited. I go, really? Because I don't want to like not get in because it's a small coffee house. So I go out and when I get there, I see Roscoe and I see Lester Bowie. And they're like on motorcycles. They just drove up on motorcycles. Lester Bowie's got a long cigar in his mouth, he's got short pants on, and Roscoe's kind of coolly decked out, okay? And so they parked, and 
I go over and start talking to them, find out that they are AECM guys too. Okay, so um, and Roscoe say, "Oh, you play trumpet, man! Bring your horn to uh, the center that we rehearse in on Monday nights and make muha, you know. And I'll the next meeting I'll introduce you and have you come into the ACM." I said, "Wow, great!" So I heard the music. Music was fantastic. That Saturday I went, and Roscoe exactly like he said he introduced me, and I became part of the. ACM. The, the week before, which was a Monday night, I take my horn, I go to this rehearsal. I meet Muhal. Muhal says, Wow, well, you know, have a seat and listen. A little rough. I said, Okay, cool. I go sit down and listen. They're playing this piece that Muhal had composed. And all the parts on the trumpet, they were messing up. Okay. And he was getting a little bit heated. You know, so all of a sudden he turned around and says, Hey, you got your horn? Go get it. So I go get the horn, I come back, and he says, Play that part. And of course, I played it. And everybody in the band turned around and looked to see who this guy was who just came up and played this part. So after that, Moho says, uh, Well, you know, uh, come to the meeting. I said, Yeah, Roscoe said he would introduce me. He said, Cool. So that puts me in ACM. I started bringing music to the ACM. Now I'm still looking for this something that I really feel I need, but don't know what it is. All I know is I'm looking for it. And then I brought music to the ACM. Nobody was rehearsing their music, only move all work. Primarily because the guys was a little lazy. That's really what it boils down to, because move all didn't object. When I came in, he said you can bring music if you want. The first day, I bring music. And everybody see that, then they start bringing music, okay? So now when I'm rehearsing with them, I'm still feeling something. So one Saturday morning, sitting on my couch in what's called Old Town in Chicago, I make this piece called The Bell. And at the end of The Bell, I make some configurations and put it in a dotted box because I don't really know what I'm gonna do with it. It's part of this other part, but it's different from that. And I want to highlight it by putting it in a dotted box. And so I go to rehearsal. I didn't play that piece, I played other music. Then the next couple of days, Braxton, uh, Leroy Jenkins, and I started rehearsing. And we played that piece. So Anthony has his first recording coming out, three composition of New Jazz. Uh, this is 1967. So we're in rehearsal. Moore is there, Braxton, Leroy, and myself. And we're practicing the pieces that we're going to do. Well, we had played that same bell with Moore Hall and Braxton Leroy and myself a week earlier. He says, let's listen to some of the music we did last week. And he heard the bell and he says, I saw him, you know, Braxton kind of walked around and rubbed his, his chin when he's kind of banging. Then after we had listened to the music and get back, going back to rehearse, he says, uh, Leo, would you mind if we record the bell? I said, no, please do. So we rehearse the bear. We go to the recording studio. We record the bear first. Boom. Get in the listening booth and in the playback at the end of the bear where that stuff was in the dotted box, that's when I discovered how to use it. It was written with stems on it, but with a lot, without no um, note heads or anything like that. It was just written with stems and it had space in between it. And all four of us played, the, the amount that was written there, I think it was five of those something written there. But at the end, I played another one, Muho played another one, I played another, he played another one. And in that playback, I discovered, that was my discovery of the rhythm units, which is the first component of my approximation. I discovered by actually hearing what it, what it did and then I attached the information to it. And what the information was is that there's a sound and after the sound follows a silence. And that both of them, their relationship is relatively equal. Not perfect, but just relatively equal. And that was the beginning of the, of the approximation language, which I call at that time a different name. I call it a invention. I changed the name to approximation. And the word Ankh comes from Egypt. It's the cross 
that you see in the pyramid text, and you see it being pointed at the head, the mouth, the throat, and the chest in those places. And the word Ankh means vital life force. So, so I got this historical, long, powerful word that has something about vital life force. Then I put the next thing I put on it was Ras. And Ras in Ethiopia means head or father or head creator or the main person. So I took that to mean father. And then I put Ma on it. And I took it to mean mother. So now I have found my right wording, which is, which is called Ankarasmation, which means the vital life force of mother and father or father and mother. It's, it's not composition and it's not exactly improvisation. Though the elements of both of those high marks in composition and in improvisation is mixed up. And all three of them are important for me. Composition, improvisation, and approximation. They all three of them are very important. I use all three of them all the time. You see, I would never make a distinction and call myself an improviser. I would never do that and say, say that I'm a composer or an opera tomato. <laughs> I would never do that. Because to me, that limits how I look at my universe. And my universe is based around, of course, our family and social structure within our society and stuff like that. But the one that, that, that I make my statement that's gonna be a legacy for me and my footprint on the planet is making art, okay? And that art uh, gives me this notion about uh, uh, my presence here. And that's what I wanted it to do.
Thank <laughs> you.